I'm going to begin this uh, third lecture in the series uh, by answering one of the questions that was posed yesterday on the method of calculating the melting temperature of high entropy alloys. And it was a very good question because um, uh, there were two methods presented, but I had only tested one of them against experimental data. And the way in which uh, I calculated the um, temperature was uh, by looking at these combinations of uh, binaries uh, and uh, in this high entropy alloy and using this equation uh, where we look at the binary liquidus temperature multiplied by the concentrations of the two components of the binary and then divide by the concentration the sum of the concentrations and when i looked at this again I've made an obvious mistake, and that is that I've included nickel chrome twice, okay? So that shouldn't be the case. So I've done a correction, and I get a new temperature of 1,401 degrees centigrade, which agrees even better with the actual melting temperature, which was uh, published as 1,400 degrees centigrade. And the way in which I noticed that I had made a mistake was that I had seven of these in the previous calculation, whereas you should have just an n factorial, where n is the number of components, divided by two factorial because we are considering binaries. So there are six of these. Okay, so with this method, uh, you are using the liquidus temperatures of binaries to estimate the uh, melting temperature of a multi component system. Uh, the second method, uh, was you just use a weighted average of the melting points of the pure components. And when you do that, you get uh, a, a much lower temperature of uh, 1361 degrees centigrade. This is the experimental, and this is the one calculated in this way. Now, the reason for this large discrepancy here, and this discrepancy will become larger if there is a greater difference in the melting temperatures of the alloys, is it's very simple to illustrate uh, and, and show that this form is not actually accurate. Because look, uh, here I'm plotting the liquidus uh, temperature of iron aluminium alloys. If I simply take a linear combination here of the two elements, then Sometimes I'll have an error of more than 200 degrees centigrade, depending on the actual composition. So just taking uh, an average, a weighted average of the melting points of the two elements doesn't actually tell you about the liquidus. Whereas in the case of the other method, you are using binary phase diagrams. You know, you're using six binary phase diagrams here from which you get the liquidus temperatures and then you sum them up in this uh, way to get your melting temperature. So this has to be a more accurate method of uh, working out the melting temperature because it relies on actual phase diagram. Whereas the other one, you only, uh, in, in this particular case, you would only have four melting temperatures of the four pure elements linearly uh, added up, uh, weighted by the concentrations, okay? So this is definitely a better method of estimating the melting temperature. Okay, um, so to move on to today's lecture, <clears throat> um, this is a, a very famous uh, plot which I have uh, replotted. Okay, uh, to you know people use Ashby diagrams. These are diagrams showing a combination of properties for various kinds of materials, but. I want to ignore the detail that goes inside these. And this was published in uh, one of the nature journals uh, for this high entropy alloy. And you can see the structure of that alloy, nice homogeneous. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's a Cantor alloy. And what they did in the publication was they plotted fracture toughness versus yield strength. And uh, these, this alloy shows uh, an incredible combination of uh, fracture toughness and strength 
even uh, at uh, cryogenic temperatures, okay? So bear in mind the composition, it's chromium, iron, manganese, cobalt, and nickel. Now you will see many plots like this in the literature, plotting different things along the axes and plotting the high entropy alloys. But in every single case, <clears throat> what I find is that uh, this is somewhat misleading because it doesn't take account of the huge variety of materials that we already have. So wherever they get their HP plots, they are not comprehensive. So if you now uh, focus on just this region here, uh, then I will show you uh, the same plot. These are the same high entropy alloys and these are commercially available materials. So for example, nine nine weight percent nickel steel is for cryogenic temperatures it is used to transport liquefied uh, natural gas uh, already in a, in a you know for more than 40 or 50 years nine percent nickel steels have served that purpose they are mass produced and so on uh, and maraging steels uh, uh maraging alloys because there's almost no carbon in these uh, there they are martensitic but precipitation hardened with uh, uh, intermetallic compounds, they outperform the high entropy alloys in terms of strength and have similar toughness. And this is the alloy that's used for making uh, many aircraft undercarriages and also the shafts that uh, part of the shaft that goes through uh, a civil aircraft engine, AMAT 100. It's also martensitic and uh, with a small amount of precipitation hardening. Very, very strong and very, very good toughness. Okay. Now, this alloy, because of the alloying elements in it, would be about 30 times more expensive than this. That's not counting any costs that you would incur from large scale processing of these alloys. These are basically laboratory alloys made in about five kilogram samples so you know plots like these are really designed to impress uh, uh, research sponsors and when i approached the authors uh, of this particular paper because it was written some time ago uh, for uh, to discover whether there had been any applications uh, the answer came back as a slightly uh, joking answer that in 20 years time now, in this day and age, uh, if you have something that is that has a unique set of properties and that might be useful, it, it doesn't take 20 years to reach an application because there is such a huge amount of money available in science now. It's almost an uh, indecent amount of money available in science everywhere in the world that if you have a nice discovery, it will go into application very quickly. And the classic uh, recent example of that is the light emitting, uh, the colored light emitting diodes, which were invented in Japan. And it's one of the fastest routes to application on a world scale. So everywhere you go, you will see these light emitting diodes uh, with different combinations of colors and uh, even white ones because uh, you can excite phosphors with with that. So if you have a good material with a unique set of properties, then you do not have to wait for 20 years before it can go into application. And the failure, I think, happens because you only illustrate a few of the properties. If I was plotting cost on this as well, then you would realize that this is not actually a realistic material unless there are even more unique properties than illustrated here. Uh, this is another uh, another such uh, plot which I have um, um, replotted and removed a lot of the information because they were trying trying to claim that um, you know high entropy alloys uh, you know they have a good range of densities and uh, strength comparable to titanium alloys. In other words, you know you can have a higher specific strength. And they presented the usual Ashby type plots, but on those plots, they only included low alloy steels. 
So low LR steels come out, you know, obviously at a low strength. Uh, when you look at uh, steels which are already available commercially, you can beat any of these high entropy alloys, both on specific strength and on strength. Okay. So when you see plus like these, and uh, they are really not designed to give you a true picture of what is happening. Okay. They are basically there to impress somebody. Okay. Now um, let's uh, look at uh, the refractory alloys. Um, and refractory because you know elements like rhenium and uh, niobium and molybdenum and hafnium uh, they have very high melting temperatures so if you want to design uh, an alloy for very high temperature applications it's good to have the melting temperature high as well because you know many of the properties depend on the homologous temperature that means the temperature divided by the uh, uh, melting temperature so here, you know, uh, linearly calculated temperature, melting temperature is about uh, 2,700 degrees centigrade. And the density of this is going to be very, very high because, uh, because of the use of these uh, elements with a uh, high density, okay? 13.75 grams per centimeter cubed. So if you look at a nickel alloy, it's approximately 8.5 to 9 grams per centimeter cube, depending on, uh, on uh, what kind of alloy it is. And steels will be lower than that, about 7.8 grams per centimeter cubed. Now, when does density become important? Uh, it's not simply about light weighting, but if you have um, an aircraft engine, uh, these things are rotating at a very high speed. That means that they're exerting forces on the discs that hold the blades together, which depend on the mass of the rotating object. And in an aircraft engine, you cannot tolerate a density which is greater than about nine grams per centimeter cubed. So the move, uh, move in the high, high, um, in the refractory uh, uh, high entropy alloys is to try and reduce the density. Now you could of course use uh, refractory uh, and dense high entropy alloys if the parts were not moving, you know, for, for example in the combustor and so on. And there is, a, there is work in progress to look at the oxidation properties of, of these materials, okay, because that would become an, a really important uh, feature to be aware of uh, and in general you know the oxidation resistance is not good but by carefully engineering the different kinds of alloying elements you can in fact achieve uh, reasonable oxidation resistance as is demonstrated by Senkov and Miracle and their co-workers. Now the way in which you reduce uh, the density of the uh, refractory alloys is you use uh, lighter elements like zirconium, vanadium and titanium in here and you can achieve a density of about 6.57 grams per centimeter cubed. So this is a, a very early stage uh, in the beginning of these materials because you would need to demonstrate so many other characteristics to actually apply it into something like uh, uh, an aero engine. You know whenever we develop an alloy uh, so recently we developed a new shaft alloy for this and we developed in it in a period of uh, three three years and the reason for the development was very simple that uh, currently some of these engines have two shafts joined together so we have air mat at the low temperature end and another creep resistant material uh, steel at the other end and they're joined by friction welding and we wanted a single uh, alloy solution. We reached a technology readiness level of four within about three years, simply because there was a demand for this material. And therefore, you know, uh, when we do research in, in, uh, in the laboratory, that is the early stage of investigation on whether we are in the right direction. And then industry starts to invest heavily 
to make large scale components. And just this year, our shaft alloy has gone into a test engine. And the whole, whole uh, period from actually designing the alloy to going into a test engine uh, is approximately seven, seven years. Okay. So if there is a need, and if you actually find a material which has a unique set of properties, which solves a problem, then you can go into application very quickly. Of course, it's not flying as yet because, you know, an aircraft engine is a safety critical component and many other uh, large scale component level tests. OK, that's the key word have to be done in order to satisfy uh, um, you know, safety requirements. Uh, these alloys uh, tend to have a body centered cubic structure and the vast majority of them have their properties measured in compression because at ambient temperature uh, they have uh, they don't have much ductility at all all right now that may not matter in some applications you know intermetallic compounds uh, which are in some aircraft engines at the towards the end of the aircraft engine like the titanium aluminides they have a, a limited amount of ductility say two percent ductility at ambient temperature but that improves as the temperature increases. And if you put them towards the end of an aircraft engine, then supposing they fracture, they can just leave the engine. Okay. So, so the technology associated with an aircraft engine is immensely complex. And there are circumstances in which you can use alloys which don't have um, much in the way of room temperature ductility. Of course, uh, you know, um, all kinds of uh, experiments have, been, have to be done at the component level to see whether, you know, your design idea actually works in practice. And the advantage of, uh, of uh, something like uh, titanium aluminides is, of course, it's a very low density material compared with nickel alloys. And these have been shown uh, to have a good elevated temperature strength when measured in tension. Okay, so let's let's think, uh, you know, the largest uh, melt made of a high entropy alloy is probably of the order of five kilograms because, you know, the data that I reported for the Cantor alloy in the Nature paper, uh, they were actually proper fracture toughness tests and proper tensile tests and, and so on, you know, uh, not compression tests uh, and very simple assessments. They were rigorously done. Uh, and for that, you need, uh, you know, a certain number of kilograms of material. So, so far, uh, only kilogram quantities of high entropy alloys have been made and totally for research. And the chemical segregation uh, is in those materials on a microscopic scale. So I showed you the beautiful uh, structure of homogeneous grains with annealing twins and so on in, in the earlier slide. And that is after homogenization. Now, uh, you have to be careful with uh, some high entropy alloys that the homogenization process can be done in a single phase field. If it can't, then you will influence uh, the structure of your material. And, you know, micro segregation can in principle be treated by holding the material in a single phase region for a prolonged period of time. Uh, there is a cost associated with it, but it can be done. Macro segregation, on the other hand, uh, is impossible to homogenize in realistic timescales. And I, I will uh, illustrate that. So, you know, the problem is that we have different melting temperatures for the constituents of this uh, material. And when we are making a laboratory alloy, uh, we focus on very high purity and uh, using elemental uh, components to make an arc melt, for example. Right? If you were to scale this up, then you would not use pure elements. You would, for example, use ferromanganese. Okay, as an alloying uh, addition rather than pure manganese and pure iron because manganese itself has a very high vapor pressure. So, uh, you know, you will have problems with uh, uh, adding it to your large scale melt. 
So to make these concentrated alloys is difficult by melting and casting. If if the melting temperatures of constituents are not uh, are are very different, okay. So the ways around this in the steel industry is to use ferroalloys, for example, rather than the pure elements. Now, one problem with scaling up is that the purity, uh, you cannot have ultra pure materials to make your melt. And we already know that even in the laboratory made alloys, very small concentrations of carbon which come in through the arc melting process will cause the precipitation of carbides in these alloys. Okay, So what needs to be investigated is that when you scale this up and you're going to use uh, constituents which are not pure, what are the consequences of that? So there's a whole interesting area of research to be done on the scaling up of these alloys. So this is uh, a, an illustration of the micro segregation that exists uh, when you make, for example, um, a chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel alloy in the s cast condition. You see the classic uh, dendritic solidification and uh, this is a composition map uh, of a particular solute in this. And you, you can have this map for each of these solutes and see that there is, there is partitioning uh, during solidification because you're not going to cool at equilibrium rates in general. Now, let's assume that the composition variation follows, uh, follows a sine wave, right? So it, it's something like this. It has an amplitude and a wavelength. Uh, and you can describe, uh, you know, these, these guys did some classic work on homogenization. Uh, and you can describe that as a sine wave with a certain wavelength and uh, amplitude A. And this is the mean composition. Then you look at uh, homogenization. And tau here is the time taken to reach 1 upon E, where E is your uh, natural number, 2.718 of the initial amplitude. You can never perfectly homogenize, but you want to decrease the amplitude of the wave and the time taken to reach 1 over 2.718 of the initial amplitude uh, is given by the wavelength squared uh, over 4 pi squared into the interdiffusion coefficient. And uh, uh, no one has done this sort of uh, work in the context of high entropy alloys, you know, they simply take it and homogenize it and hope for the best. Uh, but uh, in the case of uh, steels where you have uh, manganese variations, um, you can see uh, that at 1275 Kelvin, it takes approximately 150 hours uh, to, to reach uh, a pretty low variation in manganese concentration. And if it is 1175K, then it would take many more hours. And the data that I've seen for higher entropy alloys, they usually anneal for a thousand hours at uh, something like uh, 1200 degrees centigrade. But bear in mind that whatever temperature you use, it should be in a single phase field. So there will be a certain amount of time that you need to get rid of micro segregation. And in this equation, we have this uh, interdiffusion coefficient. Now, there is a limited amount of work on actually measuring diffusion in high entropy alloys. And if you look at uh, a diffusion coefficient, it will consist of two quantities. You know, you have here your activation enthalpy, H star. And if I remove the entropy, activation entropy term out into the D naught, you have this pre-exponential factor. And it is known that by having this mixture of components, you actually increase the activation enthalpy, right? So that should make diffusion in a high entropy alloy slower than it would be in a, a pure material. And the frequency factor is also reduced because, you know, if you have lots of different elements associated uh, as neighbors, then you've got to do different kinds of jumps, 
uh, depending on what your neighboring atom is. So, so this factor is also smaller in the case of high entropy alloys. So the diffusion coefficient in general will be smaller in high entropy alloys than in the equivalent pure components. I don't know whether the comparison is fair or not, but that's, uh, that's, a, that's a fact. And the diffusion coefficients that have been investigated are in the nature of tracer diffusion coefficients. So they don't include, for example, thermodynamic factors, uh, you know, where if we assume that diffusion is dependent on uh, just a concentration gradient, uh, we can't explain uh, the nature of diffusion. Uh, it should really depend on the gradient of the free energy. So there's also a thermodynamic factor that features in diffusion coefficients, which has not yet been investigated. So there's a lot of work to do here from a fundamental point of view. Now, uh, the methods that are used uh, for eliminating microsegregation uh, are not just homogenization, but for some reason, repeated melting and solidification. Now, repeated melting and solidification can only help uh, reduce microsegregation if, if you know, when you're making your um, object, uh, you start from one end and then melt it uh, to go to the other end, as in arc melting. Okay, uh, arc melting in a laboratory, and then you turn it around and you melt it again, so that any uh, any segregation over the length of your small casting can be reduced. And if you are making uh, this material uh, using powder methods, then there's often hot isostatic pressing involved. This is uh, macro segregation. So uh, this is a, a scale of half a meter. And this is a beautiful image produced by Ed Pickering uh, on an ingot which he sliced and then measured the chemical composition very, very, very tediously using X-ray, special X-ray equipment okay, to characterize macro segregation. This kind of segregation cannot be eliminated by homogenization. So one approach would be to design your alloy to be stable in spite of composition variations. So, you know, instead of having exactly equal amounts of uh, each of the elements in your high entropy alloy, you will get variation because of chemical segregation. And you can think about designing your alloy uh, so that even with those variations, it remains in the structure that you want. Uh, the crystal structure and uh, perhaps if you want a single phase it still remains as a single phase so uh, some thought needs to go into dealing with macro segregation if this is to be upscaled and this ingot although it is large it is not as large as the ingots you would make uh, for example for bearing steels and so on now one way also of dealing with this long range segregation or mitigating it is to chop off the top bit and discard it okay so that you the segregation is uh, somewhat reduced over the length of the ingot but that of course means that you're wasting material and these materials high entropy alloys are not likely to be cheap okay so you cut off and discard the worst segregated region you can also hot deform but as you know from the bending that we see in steels hot deformation doesn't resolve long-range uh, segregation it simply spreads it out into bands okay so you still need to think about how to design a high entropy alloy so that it's tolerant to those variations in composition and if you really want to scale it up then you would go to continuous casting and there are various technologies in continuous casting to reduce uh, major segregation okay so you would deform the material while it is not completely solidified so that solute rich liquid is pushed backwards and you end up with a more homogeneous solid when solidification is complete now someone uh, yesterday also mentioned uh, um, you know making high entropy alloys using uh, ball milling 
and that too is an established uh, process uh, in the context of uh, oxide dispersion strengthened alloys it's been there for a very long time and basically what you do is you put your powdered elements or, or whatever combinations of elements uh, in the right proportions and these are cast iron balls or, or something similar they basically beat the different components together to form a, a true alloy if you go on for long enough uh, and this can be a problem if uh, the it can be a problem to make some of these alloys by casting if you know elements like scandium for example are very reactive so in those circumstances you might use something like mechanical alloying but this adds a huge cost to the production of the material because this itself is a very very uh, untidy process in the sense that uh, it's very noisy it's extremely expensive to do this for large quantities of material and uh, you then have to consolidate the powder for example by extrusion now in the fusion reactor program uh, there is actually uh, large-scale um, studies of oxide dispersion strengthened iron-based alloys containing yttrium oxide particles because the yttrium oxide particles uh, nucleate helium bubbles from transmutation reactions and the more bubbles you have the more helium gas they can hold because the pressure inside the bubble is much greater if the bubble is small just like you know if you try to blow a balloon it's very difficult to start with but it becomes very easy as the balloon becomes larger so you can produce uh, these alloys by mechanical milling and then consolidation but it is going to be an expensive process and you would need to justify that process okay uh, one uh, interesting use for that sort of a process is to make high entropy carbides so someone yesterday asked a question about you know interstitial high entropy alloys uh, there are there is uh, significant work in this area so you know if you uh, take equal proportions of zirconium carbide hafnium carbide tantalum carbide niobium carbide and titanium carbide all of which have uh, uh, have an FCC lattice okay uh, and you then mill them together in equiatomic uh, proportions then you actually get a high entropy alloy which is a zirconium hafnium tantalum niobium titanium in brackets and then carbide and then you consolidate these uh, by <coughs> spark plasma sintering at uh, 2100 degrees uh, centigrade and you know using a, a pressure of uh, 60 megapascals and these materials have been shown to have better oxidation resistance in water vapor at 1200 degrees centigrade compared to the zirconium carbide here okay so there is speculation that this is because of the reduced diffusion of metal atoms and water molecules to form uh, the oxide so people are looking at interstitial type high entropy alloys. Now, from a fundamental point of view, the question arises, how do you calculate the entropy here? Okay, the entropy of mixing, because we've been using this equation, um, Avogadro's number, Boltzmann constant, uh, concentration of A, concentration of B, and that gives us the entropy of mixing. Well, uh, the problem is actually solved and has been solved for many many years um, Timken in 1945 in uh, Russia and uh, Hillert and Staffenson uh, developed uh, Temkin's model further and the problem is really quite simple you treat these two sub lattices separately okay and you know you will have a mixture of metal atoms on this sub lattice and perhaps a mixture of interstitials on this sub lattice uh, and you define the concentrations in each sub lattice by only looking at the atoms in that sub lattice so this is na and these are all the metal atoms let's say and these are all the 
interstitial atoms. And the equation is uh, very similar to this. Uh, you know, entropy, as I pointed out to you, is an additive uh, uh, quantity. Uh, so you can simply add up the entropies from the first sublattice and from the second sublattice. And this is how, uh, for example, in thermocalc and so on, you deal with, uh, you know, compounds. Okay, uh, this is a, another very interesting uh, high entropy application. Uh, where, you know, there is a problem that uh, when you have one of these batteries, uh, if you are using it at uh, low temperatures, then you will get some crystallization and that ruins the performance of the battery. So by mixing together different electrolytes, uh, in a, uh, you actually increase the entropy of mixing and the freezing temperature goes down quite uh, dramatically. Okay, so here, for example, with the particular mixture that they used, uh, minus 130 degrees centigrade, the freezing temperature. Okay? Now, this doesn't surprise us, actually, uh, because, you know, if you freeze water, it will be at zero degrees centigrade. Uh, if you try to freeze uh, whiskey, which is a mixture of alcohol and water, you have to go to a much, much lower temperature. But they have used the high entropy concept to design such a uh, such a material. Now, this uh, this particular alloy is a single phase uh, body centered cubic alloy, and you know uh, after cold rolling, uh, in a tensile test, I emphasize in a tensile test, uh, they have a strength of uh, fourteen hundred uh, more than fourteen hundred megapascals, and a peak strength uh, close to fourteen hundred, and a ductility of five percent. And then after recrystallization at a thousand degrees centigrade, uh, you know, the properties are pretty good with uh, a significant ductility. Now, of course, I can obtain this set of properties in an ordinary steel or even better than this. But there might be other, other characteristics of this which might make the material useful or not useful. Okay, so we can't just focus on this and say that we have produced a very good material because properties like these can be obtained easily okay, in, a, in a commercial material. So you have to identify what other characteristics of this system outperform anything that's already available. And that hasn't been done. Now, again, the problem with using things like hafnium and so on is that the density is uh, increases. So the density of hafnium alone is 13 grams per centimeter cubed. Now, so far, we have looked at the entropy of mixtures containing individual atoms. Okay, But I'll show you that there is a case for looking at the entropy of mixtures of particles and each particle containing, you know, uh, a, a certain number of atoms. So if we consider mechanical alloying, uh, we start with the elemental powders, and this is still a mechanical mixture, but the process of ball milling joins them up and then starts to subdivide them into ever smaller particles, smaller particles, until you get to an atomic solution. So how do we model the evolution of the entropy of mixing along this process? Okay, and you know, there's a simple modification you can do to the entropy equation that instead of just having the concentration term here, we have the concentration term divided by the number of atoms in that particle of A and the concentration of B divided by the number of atoms in that particle of B. So this will have the effect of reducing the entropy of mixing because you now have uh, clusters of atoms or particles containing uh, pure A or pure B mixing. And this is the equation that you end up with. And if you uh, substitute in this equation that uh, M is 1 and uh, MB is 1 and MA is 1, then you recover your um, normal entropy equation, which is this. So this is the entropy of mixing uh, in circumstances where either you have not mixed properly or uh, 
you deliberately want to mix particles okay and i'll explain why why uh, i'm talking about this so when you plot the free energy of mixing purely due to the entropy of mixing you know the, these terms become uh, the entropy of mixing term only becomes significant that means you know 10 joules per mole when the particle size goes below uh, a thousand atoms per particle now what this means is that if you are considering entities okay which have a large number of atoms per entity then the entropy of mixing is reduced so for example uh, we discussed uh, the equilibrium concentration of vacancies and you know that uh, that is a, actually a very powerful feature of uh, materials because it explains diffusion and you can even quench in a supersaturation of vacancies by heat treating at a high temperature and then going to a low temperature and therefore getting lots and lots of uh, nuclei so things like dislocations on the other end uh, there's there's a lot of atoms associated with each dislocation and therefore you know the entropy term will be much smaller so point defects are high entropy effect, uh, defects whereas dislocations are not so you it doesn't make uh, a useful uh, concept to talk about an equilibrium concentration of dislocations because it is the entropy term that stabilizes a defect the formation energy which will be much larger for a dislocation than for a vacancy uh, opposes the formation of a defect so when i search the literature for high entropy polymer alloys you will not find such a system where you mix together two different uh, polymer types and you produce a polymer alloy there are papers on polymer alloys all right but there are no high entropy polymer alloys however uh, when when you have large entities meeting at a junction uh, there will be an interaction at the junction and in the case of polymers the polymer chains will bend at that junction and that provides an entropy term which determines the width of this interface okay so there is some nice work showing the bending entropy due to polymer molecules and one other thing that is really interesting is that when you join particles together the a and the b atoms only feel each other's presence at the boundary and therefore the entropy uh, enthalpy of mixing is not determined by the concentration here and here but by the width of the boundary and the amount of surface you have per unit volume of the boundary they only feel each other's presence at the interface okay now uh, to go back to this uh, diagram and i explained to you uh, the problem that so far as far as i can assess okay and i might be wrong uh, you have to decide for yourself there are no unique properties being offered by high entropy alloys that cannot be achieved in uh, commercial materials okay so to make this story a success in technology as opposed to in basic science you know i, I explained to you that curiosity driven research is still a very important part of what we do in universities uh, but most of the papers start off by saying that high entropy alloys have remarkable properties they do not okay is what i claim you have to demonstrate that there is some uh, logic in using these materials not simply by looking at properties like these but by looking at a whole bank of properties and once you identify an application which requires a unique set of properties from the high entropy alloys you would need to do some really interesting work because you identify first of all a component that you want to make now that is a really important stage because once you identify the component that you want to make you will come up automatically with a bank of properties that you have to create and of course when you make the component you won't get everything precisely as you did in your laboratory 
So you must have tolerances. And I explained that in the context of uh, micro segregation that, you know, you may not need to homogenize if you design your alloy so that it has the same structure in the segregated and the non-segregated uh, or, or the less segregated regions, uh, same crystal structure, same phases, and so on. So at the beginning of your exercise, if you do this, identify the design parameters and the tolerances, then your basic research will go much better into areas which have not been explored. And that's what you really want to do. Then you can throw all your modeling tools. Okay, we've already discussed the sort of design tools uh, that you might use. Uh, you then specify a composition and processing specification. Remember that it's not simply a question of getting a set of properties, but also how you would process it. If you can't make the material on a larger scale, then uh, uh, you will fail very quickly. And then you would manufacture a small quantity and do some partial validation followed by uh, basic uh, uh, partial validation based on uh, you know very simple simple tests and if you don't uh, achieve your properties you would go back to making a small uh, sample but if you do then you should make around 100 kilograms for you know extended validation with uh, more complex assessment of the properties now when you get to this stage it has to it has to leave the university if it is to succeed. Uh, somebody has to make, you know, tons of the material because they are really interested in your concept. And if they are really interested in your concept, this, the cost of doing this here, manufacturing, extended validation, component level manufacturing and testing is orders of magnitude greater than any of this. Okay. So you have to demonstrate that in your research, you have a unique set of properties which you have done everything in your power to show will match with the original design parameters and tolerances. It doesn't mean that we will succeed here, but you have done everything in your power. And then industry has to have the vision to spend money on going forward with this. Okay? And there are many examples I can give you of this in steel's research but i think high entropy alloys work uh i'm being a bit harsh is stuck all right at just the laboratory scale experiment and someone has to take a, a leap of faith and say that look i really do have uh, an affordable high entropy alloy for this particular application and i would like you to take it forward so with that final slide, uh, I, I will finish and I'll be happy to uh, have the nice discussions that we already have been having. Okay, so I'll stop sharing my screen. Uh, so there are some comments already on chat, uh, which I can start uh, by asking. So uh, the first one is uh, there has been some interest in the irradiation resistance of that of high entropy alloys. Uh, now, I do recall, uh, I do recall during my searches of the literature, um, something about uh, the study of high entropy alloys for irradiation resistance, but I didn't uh, look at it seriously. So the best thing to do would be to type into Google Scholar, uh, irradiation resistant high entropy alloys. Okay. Uh, and the second question is, how efficient can they be for hydrogen storage? Uh, I don't know, uh, really, uh, whether anyone has looked at that or whether there is any particular advantage in using high entropy alloys for hydrogen storage. Okay. Can I answer uh, this? Just uh, add the comments to this hydrogen storage. Mm -hmm. uh, Actually, there are some hydride forming elements and uh, it's uh, coming in five to six elements together. <clears throat> and uh, it's mostly like a lavish phase, AB2 or A3B2. And it shows that it has the potential because of a defect lavish phase and uh, you have lots of vacancies. And uh, that uh, 
actually helps hydrogen to go into the interstitial position in much more concentrated fashion. So okay. the hydrogen storage has shown some promise and potential, but as you said that you have to do everything and then find out whether really it can replace the existing material, that uh, work has to go. But I just wanted to share that high entropy uh, intermetallics like high entropy lavish phase with five or six or seven components of mostly hydride forming elements, they are showing good potential. Well, that sounds really interesting. And, uh, you know, uh, in circumstances like that, you could actually afford to have, uh, you know, expensive elements in your material. Yeah. 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 And we have published this in Philosophical Magazine uh, later and uh, subsequent other journals also. So we are trying to look at the hydrogenation, absorption and desorption property also. Okay, very good. I look Thank forward you. to that. Uh, perhaps you can send me the paper, okay? Sure, sure. I will do that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I put some questions in the chat box if you have time to look at it. Okay. Um, so uh, it's, yeah, uh, from the beginning, I can mention the temperature you mentioned in your one of your slide is 19.7. This I sent it privately to you, but it is 18.75. If you, I mean, I just saw that uh, the chromium melting temperature is not 19.7. Okay, one so nine, that was a slide 92. You said no. The yeah, some slide where you have mentioned the chromium temperature, mm -hmm. 1907. Uh, I was a bit curious. Actual temperature is 1875. Okay. So I do not know whether it's a mistake or whether you have some other uh, correct data. I was not sure. Okay, I, I will check that out uh, later. Sure. So you sent me a message in chat, have you? Or? Yeah, privately I have chat. I did not send in the everyone more. Okay, okay. This particular comment. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I think, um, let me just, uh, oh, it's of chromium, right. Okay, I will, I will look that up and alter it. Um, yeah. Thank you. And I have another comment that diffusivity or diffusion, there are some conflicting reports that it is not so sluggish. So the question which I have put it to everyone and also to you, that there are conflicting views that the diffusion in HEAs are not sluggish. So what is your views? Can it be sluggish or not sluggish, depending on the alloy system uh, of different enthalpy and it is nothing to do with the high entropy. That yeah. is the so, conclusion so, I have. Yeah, so the paper that, uh, uh, the papers that I was referring to, uh, are tracer diffusion coefficients and there are nuances that means that if you compare the diffusion coefficients using a homologous temperature that means temperature divided by the melting temperature then there is a reduction okay but if you compare uh, at the absolute temperature then there isn't much of a, a difference so the references are on all of these slides and Pravash uh, Maybe I can make uh, the presentation available to you and then you can give it to anybody who wants it. Oh, fine. It will be fine. Okay. Yeah. So you are right. Uh, um, the comparisons are also against the pure, pure material. And I don't know, you know, whether we can say it's sluggish or not in that sense. Sure. So I will not ask, though I have one more question, but I will leave it to others. And if you have time, I can come back again. I have one more well, question. Go ahead and uh, ask. And, uh, you know, okay. I have time. I have time to go on okay. for longer. Okay. So this will be the one question which I have. You showed earlier one of uh, the last uh, lectures that uh, delta T delta SM divided by delta HM versus uh, mismatch factor. Right. And when this parameter is around one and uh, mismatch factor is slightly more than anybody thinks, anybody, any other parameter, then you say that metallic glass or bulk metallic glasses is the possibility. Right. So the, my, my question is that, is that, do you think the bulk metallic glass or metallic glass will be really a stable phase in that comparison? 
maybe it will favor but uh, formability could be favorable but uh, will it be a kind of stable compared to any other entropy or intermetallic kind of situation mm -hmm. this is question number yeah. one and subset is bulk metallic glass i guess your high configurational entropy will be all time higher than that of any crystalline or intermetallics right yes so yeah. if that is the case then bulk metallic glass in principle should be stable but the reality doesn't see that because once you do the heat treatment then it changes and crystallizes yeah so that's the dilemma so so i think um, in the case of the glassy state um, the structure is definitely not an equilibrium structure but what it means is that you are able to form the glass more easily using a, a slower cooling rate. But it doesn't mean that it's stable with respect to the crystalline state. But yeah. you know, there, there are, um, I recall a paper where you actually get a crystal to a glass transition. Yeah. Okay. And in that case, uh, you could think about the glass as a, an equilibrium phase, but I can't give you a reference at the moment, but when you know, the work on metallic glasses was uh, at its peak. Someone looked at uh, a transition from the crystalline state to the glassy state. Okay. Sure, thank you. Okay. But do you, do you agree that uh, uh, configurational entropy in metallic glass will be all time higher than crystalline material? Is that statement correct? Uh, the total entropy will definitely be higher. The configuration entropy will not be, uh, so the configuration entropy due to the different elements will not be all that different because, you know, the density of a glass is very similar to the density of a crystal. It's, it's slightly lower, but the entropy term due to the fact that it's not a crystalline lattice is a separate uh, term which would add to that. Okay, thank you. Now, someone is asking, you know, how do we get uh, these video lectures? Uh, so all you have to do is go to YouTube and look for the YouTube channel Badisha123. Okay, Badisha is my name and followed by 123. Um, is the entropy of the alloy additive to that of the individual phases? Yeah, so if you have a multi multi-phase system, then yes, you can add the entropies scaled by the amounts. And the equation that I showed at the end of uh, the entropy of mixing of particles, for example, those particles are actually separate phases. Okay, um, okay let me see what else is there. The method of explaining the melting temperature holds good only for equiatomic. No, it doesn't hold good for only equiatomic HEA. It, uh, the concentration terms are in that equation for the melting temperature. Uh, it should work for variations in uh, concentration, uh, you know, when you deviate from equiatomic. So, so uh, you know, you presented some numbers, but what we need to do is to compare those numbers with experimental data. So if you say that, look, uh, instead of having equiatomic, I have twice the amount of uh, nickel and half the amount of cobalt, uh, you can do a calculation, but we need to compare against experimental data and those data are not available. However, the machine learning model had roughly 90% success in predicting uh, the formation of high entropy alloys using the input parameters from the equations that I presented for melting temperature, for phase separation and for mixing. So there is quite a lot of validation, if you like, for, for that method. Then it says, uh, there's a question, do you think the obsession with the formation of a single phase uh, is, is, is purely ac academic? Well, you know, it starts from the origin uh, from Taiwan of the stabilization of a solution by the entropy of mixing. Uh, but if you think about the refractory alloys, people are already talking about uh, 
a two-phase high entropy refractory alloy with a structure that's not dissimilar to what we get in nickel-based superalloys of gamma and gamma prime. So you don't need to just focus on single-phase alloys. The problem might be that you introduce phases which are not good for the properties. Okay. Uh, would additive manufacturing uh, be a process for utilizing uh, scrap high entropy alloys? Uh, sorry, no. Would additive manufacturing be a good process to make HEA? Uh, additive manufacturing, of course, allows you uh, different, uh, you can put different powders together and then have a beam alloying them together. First, I think uh, you need to worry about what you want to make, okay? And then select the process for that. So the big advantage of additive manufacturing is really that you can make three-dimensionally complicated um, components. So, you know, if I'm looking at a chess piece for a castle, then I could actually make the staircases, the doors inside the castle and make the chess piece much more interesting. So that's the big advantage of additive manufacturing. So if you can think of why you would make something out of a high entropy alloy, which has three dimensional complexity, then sure, you could, you could uh, use it. Um, okay, there's another question. Sorry, go ahead. Was somebody going to ask a question or shall I carry on with the chat? Okay, then uh, there's a, uh, an interesting question about uh, uh, pinning particles introduced into high entropy alloys. Uh, and there are some papers on reinforced high entropy alloys, right? So you put some sort of a fiber in there, but you need to have a good reason for, for doing that. Uh, so once again, the work doesn't start from thinking about a component, but let's try this and see what happens. So it's an open area. Um, intermetallic phases present in high entropy alloys have various quasi-chemical atoms of different elements in the sublattice. Okay. Uh, so, so therefore, the configurational entropy of an ordered intermetallic phase in HEA can have a significant contribution. Of course, if it is an ordered intermetallic, then the configurational entropy is reduced. Yeah, because the atoms are ordered and there are fewer arrangements in which you can order the atoms than have a random distribution of atoms. So that uh, gets me to the end of uh, the chat, chat line, but are there any other questions? Um, excuse me, sir, you might have missed a couple of questions. Okay. Could you mention which one? Um, after just after additive manufacturing, I think you have skipped a couple of couple of questions. Okay, uh, so are high entropy interstitial alloys more promising than high entropy substitution alloys? So I, I think uh, the interstitial alloys we are talking about uh, compounds like zirconium carbide and so forth, and the people working on those uh, are interested in things like oxidation resistance and uh, corrosion resistance. Whereas uh, the people working on the substitutional high entropy alloys are mostly interested in uh, properties, structural properties, although there are even papers on looking at superconduction uh, and superconducting transitions in these alloys. Okay. Um, how effective would the utilization of scrap be, the recyclability? So, given that uh, we don't know what components we are going to make and therefore how much material is going to be produced and so on, it's an impossible question to answer, but it should be much more difficult to recycle high entropy alloys than any other alloys because of the concentrations uh, that we use. Uh, joining, uh, joining with friction stir welding, okay. I don't know if anybody has done that work. I certainly don't know of it, but I think it would be, uh, it would be a good method 
because you are not going to introduce too much uh, heat uh, when joining using friction stir welding or, or you don't need to have a filler material um, I think I've gone through them all now is that right um, I think yes, yeah, I think you have gone through the gone through all the questions. Mm -hmm. and, uh, can I have just two minutes of your time? Yes, yes, of course. If, uh, uh, most of the papers, those which, those which are getting published on high entropy alloys, they're mostly talking about uh, uh, mechanical properties, the deformation, and all those things. And uh, rightly, what you have pointed out, uh, micro segregation and macro segregation, which is Firstly, related to the stability of the material is a major concern. So reliability issues, while in a mission critical application, uh, their high entropy alloys will definitely fail compared to the steel and the titanium alloys and all those things. But uh, one point uh, was coming to my mind was um, how about using high entropy alloys for nuclear waste immobilization? Okay, okay discussed uh, in literature very often and uh, uh, in the wake of uh, uh, recent uh, diplomatic uh, um, situations every country has to decide on the nuclear waste immobilization within their country itself mm -hmm. so even though the alloy is immobile but it might be able to trap those dangerous radioactive elements in a better way. That's, I haven't done any work on these things, but whatever little work I have done, whatever little knowledge I have, it might be, uh, might be one of the potential areas mm -hmm. where entropy analysis might find application. And the second thing is uh, regarding the interstitial entropy alloys. Uh, though this area is very, very new, like over the last seven years or so, the, since the first paper was published, like 2014, if my knowledge, if my, I'm not too much wrong, 2014, the first paper was published. Apart from carbide, I am seeing there are a large number of oxides have come up and all, though they haven't studied to the required detail, but they might find um, functional applications also. Uh, which has not been looked at. Again, the again the stability issue is there, um, but I think that area is still a little bit unexplored. So, if you could if you could really comment on these things, that would have uh, given some directions to people, maybe. Yeah. So, I think uh, I think uh, you know your first idea um, is innovative. Okay, and that's the sort of thing that we need to study to do something different from what has already been done. So I don't know whether or not, you know, the high entropy alloys would be good for containment of uh, nuclear waste, but it is the sort of thing that would create a different research area and it may or may not. So we need to do some curiosity driven research on that aspect and on the second aspect that you mentioned. Uh, sorry, that what you say, but actually, I'm sorry to interrupt you. The paper that you referred in your lecture, I have gone through the paper. They have already showed that the tracer diffusion is much more sluggish there uh, because of the fact uh, that uh, it has got a higher entropy factor, the factor that you already mentioned over there. Hmm. So when tracer diffusion becomes really small, then uh, it might be a good uh, entrapment material for um, radioactive isotopes, maybe. So, so in that paper, uh, you'll also find that you know uh, the conclusion depends on how you do the comparison, whether you do the comparison with homologous temperature or absolute temperature, because the melting temperature of high entropy alloys is lower oh. than of uh, dilute alloys. Uh, so, so I think I think. Um, the paper actually, that paper and another paper in which uh, the measurements have been done, doesn't actually insist that there is this confusion factor that you put lots and lots of elements together, then that decreases the diffusion coefficient. Um, 
So the question uh, question is slightly open in that sense. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. So I think the participants today, now it is 52, we have a nice discussion all through these three days. I thank Professor Harry Bhadeshia on behalf of our university and also on behalf of all the participants who are present on these three days. Actually, these three lectures, we are just going through as senior students. And I always prefer this type of lecture apart besides your seminar type of things where within a very short time, 15, 20, 30 minutes, many things people are covering. But this type of, I would rather say courses, short courses helps to understand some new topic, new area. And Sir has covered from the very beginning all the features, all the aspects focusing on thermodynamics, right from phase stability at high temperature, which is the most important, whether your application is at room temperature or at high temperature. So we'll have to look at that on the phase stability. Another thing is that whether the solution is random, homogeneous or not, very good example was also given. And I find very much it is interesting to how to discern the crystal structure with example of aluminum, nickel, he has shown that whether in what, uh, when it will be BCC and when it will be FCC and referring to that ternary phase diagram, now adding other elements also with the help of our colleague, at Tata Steel. So all these things has been covered. And in our country, there is a for gas turbine engines that high entropy alloys in powder form. People are trying to use this as a coating material, only for coating material for practically there is the oxidation resistant coating materials. These high entropy alloys are being used. And can you tell me what is the your idea? Why fracture toughness of this alloy is so high? We understand about merging steel. But for this a single phase system also, you have shown that microstructure also. Why fracture toughness is so high? What is the actual reason? Um, so I, I kind of uh, hinted on that that uh, the reason why the FCC structure is a good structure uh, for, for toughness is because the temperature sensitivity of the strength is small. So when you go down to low temperatures, uh, you always keep below the cleavage uh, strength. But, but the high entropy alloy has exceptional toughness. As you saw, it was something like 200 megapascal root meters. And the specific question, uh, I, I don't know why it has, but it is definitely an FCC structure. So this is was my only, and I thank really, I'm really happy that you have agreed in spite of your all time busy schedule and possibly this pandemic situation also has helped us to be together hmm. online and going through this nice talk over the three days. You are fine, Harry? Any yeah, physical yeah. problem? Well, you know, I, I really okay. um, enjoy today, today, particularly today, I'm telling. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. And okay. Uh, let me just say that uh, I like to talk, okay? And if I have an audience, then I even enjoy it more. Okay, I sometimes talk to myself, but uh, it's nice to have an audience to talk to, okay? So I'm very happy to give uh, topics like this and you gave me enough time to prepare. That's the important thing, yeah? So yeah. thank you all very, very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you once again. Okay. Thank you once again. Thank shall you. We, okay, shall we end now? To, uh, shall we end now? Okay. 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 Oh. Goodbye, everyone.
Yeah, we are going to study and stay safe. Bye bye.